It's okay to have your work valued. It's okay to have money. And because you can do great things in the world with your money. Episode 109. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. I am your host, Ryan Willard, and this week I am joined by Dr. Brad Klons, who is a financial psychologist. He is a principal at Your Mental Wealth Advisors. He's the co-founder of the Financial Psychological Institute. He's an associate professor of practice at Crichton University, uh, Hyder College of Business, and is the author of five books on financial psychology, including Mind Over Money and Facilitating Financial Health and Financial Therapy. And this was a really fascinating conversation as uh, Brad goes into discussing the money scripts and the psychological subconscious programs that we have that are written about money and the way that we end up relating to money and how this can basically create our financial destinies. So I think this is a really crucial conversation because we discuss um, about how there might be industry money scripts in certain professions of course like architecture what that means how to identify them and how they can be transformed into something different that is aligned with what your goals are for your life so sit back relax and enjoy dr brad clons So massive thank you to all of you for listening and supporting the Business of Architecture UK for the last couple of years. Big shout out to those of you who have come to our live events, attended the webinars, and of course to those of you who have downloaded the weekly podcast and have been listening to them on your bicycles. And as you know, we love helping architects win meaningful and profitable work, but it's not always that simple to implement these ideas or translate them into something that will work for you. So what I wanted to do was to invite you onto a quick 15 minute chat with myself we can both grab a cup of tea and I'd like to ask you about what content you found most valuable and why and what you'd like to hear more of and I'd also love to hear more about your business and what you're building at the moment and where you are headed to business wise in 2020 so there's no charge or any obligation with this call just simply to find out how our content has been of value and if we get that far and with your permission of course what might be next what what might be possible and how Business of Architecture UK could be supportive of that. Does that sound fair? Brilliant. So if you want to book a 15-minute chat with me, I'm calling these calls the BOA UK Discovery Call or just simply a chat with Ryan. Use the link in the information and I look forward to speaking to you. Welcome. Welcome, Dr. Brad Klonst uh, to the show, to the Business of Architecture UK. Absolute pleasure to have you uh, with us. And you are a money psychologist. That's right. Yes. So I am a clinical psychologist by training. That's what I went to school for. Right. Um, And then I got really interested in the whole psychology of money. After I got out of grad school, I owed $100,000 in student loan debt. Right. And I grew up in a family. We didn't have much money. The idea of having debt was sort of this terrifying thing for me. I was taught, don't do it. Um, There was no other way for me to get through school. Mm. And so I, it's, it's, the timing is really interesting because I got out of school. I owed a hundred thousand dollars to load debt. I saw a friend of mine make a hundred thousand dollars in one year trading stocks and he knew nothing about the stock market. So he would be telling me about symbols he bought and how much it went up. And I'd be like, well, what's that company? He's like, I have no idea. <laughs> I'm like a ma- maniac um, making trades. And I thought, wow, this is a way to get out of debt. So I sold what I had of value which for me, Ryan, at that point was a truck. Um, And I cobbled together everything I could, put it all in the stock market. I had a fabulous three months and then the tech bubble burst. And as I'm watching my money melt away, I was, this thought went through my mind, like why would a reasonably intelligent person, at least reasonably intelligent, do something so radically stupid around Mm. money? And that got me really interested in my own psychology around money. So I started to do a lit review, right? This is what you're trained to do in school. Let's review the research. Let me find out why I did what I did. Came up empty. Um, And so I sort of joke within the matter of a a week or two, I became the world's leading expert in financial psychology because psychology had ignored the topic. Wow. Why why had psychology not been looking at this area before? Because it's so fascinating that 
human beings have got, I mean, money is so emotionally charged. We have so much stuff around it, so many sort of internal stories around it, and it really inhibits so many different people in their performance and in their professions, in their careers, and even incredibly educated people uh, can find themselves in very difficult financial situations. So why is it that, that it's a relatively new field of study for psychologists? Yeah, so, you know, Freud, Sigmund Freud, the founder of psychology, had actually identified this issue. He called it a money complex. But he also admitted that when he looked, he, you know, with regard to his father's relationship with money, he mm-hmm. would rather suppress it than think about it which is fascinating because Freudian psychology is all about not suppressing things, you know, and bringing things to conscious awareness. So I, it, it's so interesting that that's where it started. But what I, what I hypothesized, because I had going through the training, it was sort of said out loud, you know, in the mental health field, you know, we're not here to make money, Ryan, we're here to help people. Yeah. yeah. As if you can't do both. And so now what was so interesting about that is you get out of school and they'd be like, okay, here's your hundred thousand dollars in student loan debt. Now go start a business. And it's like, those two beliefs just do not go hand in hand. And so I actually did a study on it. So I was curious, that that was my experience. So we ended up doing a study on mental health professionals and looking at their financial psychology. And what we found is that they are more likely to be money avoidant. Now, what do I mean by that? They have negative beliefs about money and about wealthy people. So for example, they're more likely to believe that rich people are greedy, that money corrupts, that there's somehow virtue in actually having less money. And now those beliefs, no big surprise, if you have those beliefs, the studies we've done, it's associated with terrible financial outcomes Mm. because you end up sabotaging yourself or you don't advocate for the value of your service or your profession. And of course it ends up hurting you. And then you start to accumulate money and then you feel guilty and then you do something self-destructive. And And where where do these these beliefs come come from? from? So we all have these beliefs. And in our research, we call them money scripts. Um, They're typically subconscious for us. Like money is a very taboo topic. Mm -hmm. And so your beliefs around money, how much money you make, this isn't something that is talked about in polite society. And so there's not a lot of opportunities for us to become aware of these beliefs. So they're sort of deeply held in our subconscious minds. We typically get them from our parents, from our grandparents, from our culture, from you know, our socioeconomic sort of tribe, if you will, and their entire ways of looking at money and the world that have a significant impact on our financial life. It's very interesting. I can hear um, of similarities with the psychological or the psychiatrists, um, psychologists' profession and architecture. Uh, and in the architectural industry, money is a big complaint but rather it's the low fees that architects get paid. And this kind of exists as a, you know, we need to be doing more in terms of unionizing. We need to be doing more in terms of like communicating value. Like architects are often campaigning towards the institutional bodies that we should be getting paid more. But it it sounds like there's actually, you know, I kind of have a suspicion that a lot of us as architects are carrying around these, money scripts that are kind of hidden for view, hidden from view. How do you begin to unearth them? Well, first of all, um, we all have them. So it's definitely the case. And secondly, I have to at least applaud your profession for recognizing that they actually are worth more than they're getting paid. Like that's, that's actually huge. And the fact that you would advocate for that um, shows that you're at least making some progress in terms of how much you're valuing yourself and your service. And that's kind of where it, where it is at its core. Right. It's like, you know, it starts with what you believe you're worth um, because this happens on an individual level. It happens on a professional level too. Um, whatever you believe you're worth, like at a, at a very core value, the rest of the world is going to agree with you. That's what's so interesting. It's sort of this, this thing that we project into the world around our value. And then people end up saying, oh, okay. Um, and, but if you truly don't believe it deep inside, you're not going to get that kind of response. It's sort of this weird, um, I, I dare I say, metaphysical sort of thing where you can actually tell somebody immediately, like subconsciously, you can tell somebody walking across the street whether they take pride in themselves and they value themselves or they don't. And it's written all over their face. It's written all over their posture. And that gets transmitted subconsciously. 
Um, and by the way, there's been a bunch of studies done on this too, in terms of like posture and how you're holding yourself. And um, with that sort of level of confidence, which is really rooted in this deep belief of your own value, people are more likely to pay you more. Right. And, and I mean, I can understand from, uh, say, for, from an architect's perspective, that we will be, we know that we're being, we're undercharging. We know that we're not being able to communicate value and our worth as effectively as we would like to. And so often we will address kind of strategies and tactics and ways of communicating, but not necessarily address these mindset issues. Yes. And it is, I mean, for me, obviously you're talking to a financial psychologist, but for me, it is, it is all about mindset. Um, I mean, in studies we've done, we've done several studies now on looking at the psychology of wealth. And by that, I mean, what are these beliefs and this attitude towards yourself and the world? And does that, you know, do, if you have those beliefs, are you more likely to end up in the wealthy group versus like a middle-class group, for example? And, and the answer is absolutely. So we have really linked this to um, beliefs you have about money, attitudes you have about yourself in the world. Um, like for example, one that is really powerful is called locus of control. And locus of control basically means locus is location. So in terms of the control in your life and your outcomes in your life, like what's happening for you, do you mentally attribute that to you? So you have an internal locus of control, like you're the author of your life and your outcomes, good or bad. Mm. Or do you attribute those to the external world where it's everybody else? It's either, your, you know, it's their fault, for example. And our studies have very clearly shown, and actually a lot of studies have shown this in a lot of domains, not just around wealth, but people who have an internal locus of control um, end up in that wealthier group. People who have an external locus of control, believing that, you know, their outcomes are due to everyone else and it's somewhat out of their control, have worse financial outcomes. And so that's something that in my social media efforts and educational efforts, I'm really trying to help people garner that internal locus of control. Um, because if you believe that you are responsible for your outcomes, it's just incredibly good for you because here's what's going to happen. You're going to fail. You're going to fail miserably. Um, and studies have shown that, you know, millionaires, the average millionaires had like two or three of these like catastrophic failures. Whereas the average non-millionaires had about one which means that they either didn't try or they quit after the first one. But if you have an internal locus of control and you make a mistake, it's so incredible because you're basically blaming yourself for that, um, which is what I did, thankfully, when I lost all my money in the stock market. It would have been really easy to blame tech or the government or banks or whatever. Yeah. Um, of course, then you never learn anything about yourself. Mm -hmm. um, but if you can really sort of take responsibility and think about where did I go wrong? What was I thinking? Where did these beliefs come from? What can I learn from this experience? It's pure gold. Like failure is pure gold because that's where you can really learn and grow. But you really need to have that internal locus of control to capitalize on it. And, and so what would you say to people that would be or that would make the distinction between uh, that certain circumstances playing a part in their ability to create wealth? So some people might come from a much more uh, less privileged backgrounds and certainly in in architecture this happens a lot where typically it's a, it, because of the length of study and because of the uh, the kind of pay that happens at the end of it it's it still remains a fairly exclusive uh, profession and it's very difficult to get into just because of the the sheer costs of entry versus the kind of return on investment um it are these circumstantial things real or not, not. Yes, no, super important point. Um, and the, the answer is absolutely they're real. Um, how, the question is how much do they actually matter to you, like in terms of your life outcomes? And certainly growing up in a lower socioeconomic group or as a, um, for example, a minority, whether it's religious or um, mm -hmm. your ethnicity or you know, your disability status, I mean, whatever, whatever it is, many more obstacles for yeah. sure. And those are very real. And I would never dismiss those. Mm. But the question is, do you believe that, that therefore, um, for example, because you have a disability, you are unable to ever be successful? And that's an internal belief. And um, it's, it's actually not true. You can be. And um, all it takes is one example of somebody just like you who did it to disprove the belief that it's impossible. Yeah. Yeah. It's, 
it's really fascinating actually i was at a talk in a property uh, seminar or a property meetup actually a few months back and a guy called david pearl who's i think he said he was worth about a quarter of a billion pounds um and he got up on stage and he spoke and he and to see him he looked like a, a very sort of disheveled character like he would never he did not fit the sort of stereotype of what you th- might think a, a multi-millionaire looks like and he started his talk by recounting his childhood. Um, he was a, a Jewish guy and he grew up in, in quite extreme circumstances, uh, you know, where you know, the family often didn't have enough money to be able to eat. There was maybe a large family all living in a single room. And he started off the talk by saying that that experience, looking back on it now, was a privilege. And that really struck me as something unusual to say um, about how he'd sort of reframed his relationship to money. So is that what you're, what you're kind of pointing towards? It's how we kind of reframe our relationship to money and our circumstances. Yes, because, you know, in psychology, what we really know to be true is on a very fundamental level across so many different life outcomes, like what you actually believe you tend to sort of manifest. It's, it sort of becomes true. Like, for example, if I believed that everyone was out to get me and um, the world is an ugly place, I would then approach the world as if that's true. And I would get a ton of, ton of ugliness right back at me because I'd be walking around with that belief and, and basically behaving in that way. And then people wouldn't like me. Um, right. And I'd have a bunch of bad experiences just as an example of how your internal reality creates your external reality. And it's so interesting that 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 speaker mentioned the blessings or at least the advantage he had by having extra obstacles to climb. And that's certainly the case. Um, And for me, though, it's so important to realize that those obstacles exist and the world is utterly not fair. Um, And Mm -hmm. let's just start with that. It's just not. No matter what you do, it's not fair. Um, Nobody has nobody comes into the world with all the same advantages. Um, you know, along all those different status and and what might put you in a minority class and make things more difficult for you. Um, But it it really comes down to what your beliefs around your capacity and ability to um, climb, for example, the socioeconomic ladder. Um, And if you believe that you can, you certainly can. Um, And if you believe that you can't, you can't. And another thing that, that you pointed to are stereotypes of the wealthy that become mindsets that, ex- that sort of excuse, and I, I, don't, I use that word hesitantly, excuse your um, you know, ability to become successful. So it's sort of an excuse to not get there. And we, so I did a study a couple of years back with um, Paul Sullivan, who's a reporter at the New York Times, and he writes a column on, on wealth. And what, what we did is we examined some of these stereotypes um, because these stereotypes, first of all, I didn't know if they were true. Like, so I grew up in a lower socioeconomic um, family. And so I was always sort of curious, like, is it true that, you know, in order to become rich, you have to be born rich? I mean, is that actually a true thing? Mm. Um, because if it is, obviously, that's an important thing to know. Um, do you have to, had you, you had to have gone to private school? Um, is that also the case? So anyway, we put together a study that looked at the psychology of wealth and looked at these stereotypes. Um, and I got to say, thankfully, um, you know, those didn't apply to our, our sample over here in the U.S. And what we found is that the majority of these ultra wealthy people were self-made. They um, went to public school. The vast majority went to public school. They didn't have like chefs and, and private chauffeurs. Like That was a minority uh, of these individuals. And which really hits sort of hits at the stereotype too, that um, people who have money are lavish spenders of luxury items. And um, as we were talking about, um, you and I were talking about before this podcast, you know, there, there's been a lot of evidence to show that that's absolutely not true. And if you want to become wealthy, you know, you need to actually save money. Like the definition of wealth is something that you've acquired and held on to. If you're spending it all, it disappears. Um, and sort of the stereotype of, of wealthy people over here in the U.S. is that they're luxury. They drive luxury cars. Everything yeah. is like designer clothes. They have a $10,000 Rolex. All of it is utter bunk and a destructive belief because then people, once they get a decent salary, they'll start extending themselves, you know, to buy a Mercedes Benz, for example, or to buy a flashy watch. And then what they do is they end up getting in trouble. So now they have debt and then they spend sometimes decades trying to climb out of it 
And it's all based on this false narrative of what wealthy people actually do. So can you can you go into a little bit more about that, actually, about the sorts of how do wealthy? Well, first of all, what is wealth? How do we how do we define what wealth is? And and also, what is the difference between how a wealthy person thinks and how someone who isn't wealthy thinks? Right. So fabulous question. And so one of the one of the ways I ask it is, you know, what is what's rich? Yeah. Yeah. You know, so what makes you rich? And the answer is that um, a rich person is someone who has more money than you do. <laughs> I've never met, I, I mean, I've never met anyone who's like, yeah, I'm rich, you know, and feels comfortable with that. And a lot of times it's because many of these people are self-made and so they don't ever feel like they've actually gotten there. Mm. Um, and what's so interesting is that every, every um, rung on that ladder that you climb, you're going to see that people have way more money than you above that. Um, and so you never sort of get to the point where you're feeling like you're rich. So the, the, what I'm getting at here is it's an entirely a subjective mark. And when you do studies and you say, like, how much money would it take for you to be happy? People always, you know, if you ask somebody who makes 50000 they say 100 You ask somebody who makes 100 they say 200 You ask somebody who makes 200 they say 300 and on and on it goes. Yeah. Um, it's sort of that hedonic treadmill that we all feel like, you know, wherever – you know, we, we have this desire to climb and to, to succeed, but we never quite get there. You mm. never feel like you're quite there. It's part of human nature and part of our struggle to understand that. Um, so wealthy has a tendency to be only in comparison to the people around you. That's really how we do it. And um, if I was in a underdeveloped country and um, living in what would look like poverty over here, and I had five goats and my neighbor had two, I would feel wealthy. I would have these subjective psychological experience of feeling like everything's fine. I'd have low stress in that area. Um, Whereas if I had one goat, I'd have a massive amount of stress and I would feel like I'm living in poverty. So it's entirely subjective based on who you're around. All right, so it's kind of natural, you're naturally just comparing and and making a relative spectrum through which you're defining what wealth is. Exactly, and then of course we we base our, our sense of wellness based on this subjective comparison which has become, I think, much more toxic in the last decade around social media. Um, And not to throw, you know, rocks at social media. I I think it it can be a very good thing. But what's happening is there's a false narrative, like on Instagram, for example, Hmm. where people are seeing like, oh, this is what rich people do. And so I'm constantly on there and, and other platforms going, no, 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 that's not what the data and that's not what the science suggests. And if you try to play that game, you're actually not going to become wealthy. Well, th- this is really interesting, actually, because I can see this conflict playing out in the architectural industry, for example, where there is often a kind of adversarial combativeness between architects and our clients. And architects, we come from a humanitarian creative background. We'll often defend the art more above anything else and we will we will be like nope the art is more important than money and you know we're doing it for the good of the you know the good of the city and for people and that often the clients that we work for by nature are very wealthy um and we you know we, we are work, we are working for sometimes people who purely see architecture and our art as a financial instrument um and there's a, there's a kind of innate conflict in that. So kind of seeing it in, from a different way or, or changing that conversation, I can see, can, well, ha- holding on to that conversation clearly uh, prevents us from communicating value in some way. You know, it's, it's so interesting, Ryan. I just learned something from you just now. Um, and it, it's sort of the artistic nature of architecture. And I, in my head, I had already, already I had, had it sort of on the mathematical side. Um, so now it totally makes sense to me. So um, with that artistic nature, mm. um, very similar actually to um, mental health professionals and educators and all of which who sort of land more in that money avoidant category. Yeah. Um, and because it's about the art, it's about the purpose, it's about my passion. Um, yes. And so I think we're sort of naturally wired to, to have the money be secondary. So probably more hesitant to um, like maybe even getting nervous when it comes down to discussion around fees um, Mm. versus excited. Like somebody with a different mindset loves that conversation. (laughs) Yeah. Um, Whereas the artistic types have a tendency to want to avoid it and also frankly be really hurt 
when somebody has putting a lower price tag on something that, you know, really sprung from your heart, right? Around yes. this thing that you created. Um, and so that's something to watch out for. And, and also to look at, you know, what sort of, do you have negative beliefs around wealthy people and around money itself? And quite often those go hand in hand. Mm. And, and the real rich um, experiment for you is to think, is to start to think about, well, where did I get those beliefs? Like, where was I taught that? And quite often it'll be in our childhood by our parents or grandparents or et cetera. Um, and very often too, it comes from the direct experience of either a, an ancestor or something in our own life of some wealthy person being a total jerk and hurting people. And by the way, if that's your belief that rich people are greedy and money corrupts, you have no problem finding people to prove you right every day, <laughs> you know? Um, but what it really, what it really excludes is the other side of the coin. And so it really pays to really understand that there are people who are doing um, incredible things in the world um, and they are wealthy and their wealth allows them to have even a global impact in a positive way. And so part of it's reframing and challenging sort of that assumption and really understanding on a core level that I can be a good person doing fabulous things in the world. And if I'm able to become wealthy, I can even do more good in the world. Interesting. Yes. And it's, it's, quite fascinating to me as well like uh, I'm sure other artistic disciplines have this as well that there is a relationship between if you are doing commercial work for example in architecture this is quite a, a, a sort of traditional perspective that's held that if you're doing work that's commercialized or is, a, is about the money that it kind of lacks artistic integrity and it's not as good and we were we revere these characters in the architectural profession, Frank, Frank Lloyd Wright, for example, who was famously always going bankrupt. Louis Kahn kind of died penniless in you know Pennsylvania Station in New York. Um, we kind of have these mythologies around these architectural heroes about how they didn't have money. And it kind of gets, you know, we kind of get taught this in a way that if we're going to be doing architecture for money, then somehow our craft will be lessened. Right. I mean, what an incredibly destructive message from my point of view <laughs> and sort of <laughs> romanticizing, you know, that, that experience of chronic financial deprivation. Um, and you know, it, that's the, that's the, you know, in, in our money script research, that's the item that says there's virtue in living with less money. Yes. Like that somehow makes you more virtuous. And, and frankly, there are religions that sort of reinforce this idea. Like one of the things, um, just for example, the Bible is often misquoted, you know, it says like, um, you know, money is evil, you know, money is the root of all evil. Yeah. Like, for example, is, mm. is a real common misquote. That's actually not what the text actually says. It's the love of money is the root of all evil. And I could get on board with that, you know, yeah. um, but just this connecting that money and evil. No, 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 no. I mean, I, as a matter of fact, I want the most virtuous people in the world to have all of the money. I mean, is it, wouldn't the world be a better place? And so I think it's wrapping your head around that where it's okay to um, have your work valued. It's okay to have money. Um, and because you can do great things in the world with your money. And please do. And I, I think you will. I know you will. Um, don't leave it to all the evil people. <laughs> yes. Yeah. No. Uh, and this is a conversation that we have a lot on, on business of architecture is, is, you know, when you're able to generate and build a business that's bringing in money, you can do a lot of good with that capital. You can reinvest it. You can redistribute it the way that you choose. You can put it towards all sorts of great and wonderful projects. It's a, it's a great facilitator. Um, but it is a subject that from very early on in education is kind of avoided and not talked about, which I've always found quite baffling. And it has a big impact on the industry and, you know, uh, a lot, a lot of professionals who are for 10 years worth of education, you know, you come out and become a qualified architect and the statistics are showing that the, the fees of qualified architects is, is very low comparatively to um, lots of other professions or even other professions on the same building site with a lot less, with a lot less risk and, um, you know, indemnity and insurances that they're carrying around. Uh, we're getting paid a lot less, which is quite fascinating. It really is. And I think um, what happens is that, you know, we are attracted to people um, that think like us. 
Mm. And so we're, we're um, here we are in modern society, but really we're very tribal. Our brains are very tribal. Um, and we can, we basically cluster around professions too, for example, as a tribe, right? So we, we cluster around people who have similar values and beliefs. And um, one of the things that, that I suggest to people is that socioeconomic status ends up being a tribe. And a tribe has certain customs, they have certain beliefs about what's, what's reality, about how money should be used. And what I always encourage people to do, if, if you're looking to advance yourself into a field perhaps you've never been in, or you wanna you know, be able to acquire more money, then to find somebody who's a step or two ahead of you and start um, picking their brain around how they're looking at life, how they're looking at the world, how they're looking at money and relationships. Um, and because really, if you want to move into another socioeconomic group, if you want to move into another profession, I mean, whatever it is, you really have to understand the culture and the beliefs. So, so what are the kind of typical financial mistakes that you will see professionals making? Yep. So, Part of it is, um, I think we're hitting at right now is, is undervaluing your work, which leads to a whole host of, of bad things. Yeah. Um, and some people are avoidant of the whole word business, you know, mm -hmm. like that becomes sort of offensive. You hooked them up to a, a stress tester. You'd probably see it going off the chart like business. No, I'm an artist or whatever. Right. Yeah. Um, but, but you're, yeah, but you're selling your art, right? So that's a business, you're a business person, sort of, sort of embracing that idea. Um, and then if you, if you can embrace the idea that you are a business, then you can look around and see, well, what do businesses do? Like, um, what sort of, uh, structures do they have? Do they have, do they have accountants they work with? I mean, do they look at their profit and loss statements? I mean, you have to learn how to run a business. Um, but in order to do that, you have to be willing to embrace the concept that you are a business. And I, that can be a huge hurdle. Um, yeah. the other thing that I see people make a big mistake people make is, they have sort of like what I call do it yourself itis. Okay. So, um, what I, like I mentioned, I grew up lower socioeconomic and it was like, you know, you have to do it all yourself, mm -hmm. you know? So the idea of like hiring an accountant was ludicrous. You just do your own taxes. Um, but what, what we found in our research too, is that people who are able to make it into more of that ultra wealthy status, they hire help along the way. Cause they don't, you can't be an expert in everything. Um, so whether it's bringing on a business partner who brings in a skill set you don't have, or even paying a person for an hour of their time, for example, an attorney or a tax professional or a financial advisor, just to run scenarios by them. Um, and perhaps you can say, hey, look, this is where I am now. What do people in my profession that you've worked with, how do they get to the next level? Like, what, do, what are you seeing that I'm missing? Um, and being open to, to getting that advice and expanding your team. Um, a huge mistake I see people make is waiting way too long before they bring in some expert consultation. Right. So they're, they're just kind of becoming a bottleneck, if you like. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that is something that I can hear in the architectural industry as well. Lots of one man bands or small practices that are kind of taking on absolutely everything. And then it's, it becomes a kind of a vicious cycle of not being able to afford or the conversation, the internal conversation is we can't afford to do something. We can't afford to hire somebody else. So we have to do it all ourselves. And then right, it's and, and yeah, huge mental barrier because you might be thinking that you need to have all these people on staff when really you could just buy an hour of their time and yeah. you could like, you know, I mean, you could just quantum leap with it. You know, you could do a three or four years of making mistakes in that one hour by um, having that expert advice. Fascinating. Very interesting. What this kind of leads on to the question of, um, of when we're looking at our relationships to money, we start to ask the question, well, what is money? Um, and it's quite interesting, particularly in the world of marketing and sales, we talk about value a lot. And value is kind of ultimately a psychological thing, as is money. It's some, it, you know, when we kind of look at it, it's a kind of agreement between people. And money is always coming from somebody else, essentially. It's always another, it's always some kind of human interaction where there is an exchange of money. So from you, as a, from a, a psychological standpoint, how do you define what money is? And does that definition begin to open up new ways of thinking about the possibility for building wealth? Yeah, at its very core, you know, money is, is basically a symbol, 
Like it, it, the paper is actually not worth anything. Mm. Um, and when you think about it, like what is gold actually worth? Like if you, if you were coming from another planet and you found this piece of shiny metal, you're like, wow, I mean, I guess that looks kind of cool, a little bit shiny. Um, but there's all this value placed on it. And so really it, it, it basically is a convenience. So instead of us, um, you know, trading a goat for, um, you know, a sheep, we, we now have money that allows us to um, have commerce, but it's all based on this shared understanding and belief. Um, and it, so it's all, it's all a bit, little bit fantasy. So we're all agreeing that this means something and that's mm -hmm. what makes it work. Um, and so it, in and of itself, it, I see it more as a tool um, than anything that's going to sort of magically, you know, you know, make your life better, make you happier, that kind of thing. Um, so I think it, it really pays to look at it as a tool that we're all just agreeing means something. And kind of looking at how wealth is distributed amongst human beings, is this then a psychological phenomena that is happening that is causing these kinds of um, the wide variance in who has the wealth in the world? And, or is that the wrong way of thinking about it? Well, you know, at the risk of entering into political discussion, yeah. um, you know, I'll just tell you what, what I see to be true. Mm. Um, and I've, I work with a lot of um, what you would call ultra wealthy people. And um, also in our study, like most of the people made it themselves. And so there's a very clear pattern. Um, the clear pattern is this. Somebody is, has a mindset that, oh, I need to save money. And so what they do is, um, and this is a mindset that they've got early on, you know, the wealthier, wealthier they are. Yeah. Um, and so I, I see people, two, two people doing the exact same stuff. Um, you know, one's in their 60s and they have no money and the other is a multimillionaire. And it's not that there was an unfair, the only unquote unfairness involved is the fact that one person had this mindset where I need to save 20% of my income or 30 um, if I want to become wealthy and have my money work for me. And the other person didn't have that mindset. And so I see that so often um, that, that I do know there are other factors that come into play for sure. Mm. Um, but I also, you know, I see that as something that I can actually teach anybody. Um, for example, if, I, if you saved $100 a month um, and you did that for 54 years at 8% interest, and by the way, the stock market um, has returned like 10% over the last hundred years, um, you'd have a million dollars. So from my perspective, there's no reason why just about everybody couldn't become a millionaire. Um, the math is very simple. Um, the thing that's missing is this mindset sort of drilled into your brain early on that I should save money. And is it, is it purely just the act of saving or is it using those savings to build other kinds of cash flowing assets or is, would, purely just saving. It's so interesting you say that because Ryan, basically all you would need to do is put it in like a fund that sort of covers the market. Not, I'm not talking about being smart and getting, buying the right stock or this or that. It's, I'm talking about like index, like set it and forget it right. kind of investing. Um, and yes, like you, you certainly, so I think it's, all, this is what I think is great. And I encourage people to do this, have a plan A and have a plan B. And I'm a huge proponent of this. Plan A is that you are going to just save 20% of everything you make. And if you're making, um, you know, a, a thousand or 2000 a month, you know, you'll be a millionaire. So you just save it. You, you invest it in a index sort of account that covers the market. Um, and you leave it in there. And, and then go ahead with plan B and try to start a business or make money more aggressively, mm. but you can never rob from plan A. Don't touch it. It's untouchable. Um, cause plan A sort of guarantees your success and you can be a, um, you know, not much above a minimum wage earner and become a millionaire with that mindset. Wow. Um, the, the problem is that we get tempted because, you know, you get your first paycheck and then you're like, okay, I'm going to buy a car. Um, and you know, not really realizing that the road to wealth is, is perhaps maybe you don't buy a car or you buy a cheaper one, but you think, Oh, I got my first paycheck. So, um, I just heard this example of somebody in the military who got their first paycheck. Um, you know, the military is paying for their housing and they, they literally are spending half of their money on a car. And it's like, you know, that is, that's not what wealthy people do. That's what people think wealthy people do. It's just not true. Wealthy people do not behave that way. There's no way to become wealthy by doing that. 
<laughs> so, um, you know, if you, if you're looking to be self-made, it's this mindset of like, I'm going to save 20, 30% or even more of everything I make. Um, and if you start early, it doesn't hurt because when you start early, you don't make anything, you know, and then all of a sudden you're making money. And so it's real easy to set aside that 20%. And then as you make more over time, you know, that the actual dollar amount, um, grows. And so, and then the other, and then the last thing is like, don't do anything stupid. And that's the hardest one, to be honest, Ryan. So, <laughs> like, like anything stupid would be, you know, so you've been saving for 10 years and now you look in there and you're like, whoa, I have $200,000. And, and so you're like, you know what I'll do? Buy a boat. I'll go start a business. <laughs> I'll go start. Yeah. Buy a boat. That's even worse. Right. Um, or I'll go start a business with that money. And it's like, no, 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 don't do that. Don't do that. Because that's, right. you know, most businesses fail. Um, and so odds are you've just, you know, your money's all gone. So it's not even a kind of high risk strategy. It's just a very, con it's just a very consistent, thoughtful discipline. Exactly. Low risk. And a lot of young people that I interact with on social media are like, um, you have to be a good trader or a good investor. I'm like, no, 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 don't do it. That's not how wealthy people are making their money. Like those are the stories you hear. You hear about somebody who bought, um, you know, cardboard when it was a penny. <laughs> you know, mm. um, and now it's worth so much more or whatever. Um, and those stories are very compelling and we love to see them, but that's not actually what the majority of wealthy people do. The majority of wealthy people have professions like yours and they're squirreling away money on the side. And then all of a sudden they have, they're a millionaire. I mean, it just sort of, it just happened. They're not expert investors by any means. Um, and you know, that, to be an expert investor, you know, like that's your, that's your profession, right? So you've dedicated your entire life to that. And what they found, um, a lot of studies done on this, these professional investors who have, you know, Ivy League degrees in finance, um, in any given year, 80% of them don't beat the market in general, which, is, which would be considered like an index investing right. strategy. And so just, just understand, people who've dedicated their lives to becoming expert investors, 80% of the time, they don't do as well as sort of the average market. So the, the, my goal, the goal I tell people is if you can be an average investor, you are far above average because most people do something stupid along the way. And, and is this something that you could, that you would recommend doing even if you've got, if you're broke, if you've got very little cash flow coming in and you're on that kind of, you know, you're trying to get your business to work or you're, you know, is, is, could you still be saving? Can you still be putting money aside? Is it, a, is it a discipline to begin regardless of how much income you've got coming in? Or is it something, and I can see there being a bit of a pitfall here that you're always waiting to be earning enough before you start saving. That's exactly right. And, you, and you're never, ever going to earn enough to be able to start saving. So let me just start right there. It's never going to feel like that. Um, so it, it's more about the habit. It's about, you know, you're listening to us talk about this right now. You're going to go automate some sort of movement from a, you know, into a savings account or investment account or whatever. If you have a company that does that or a governmental job where you just push the button and let it happen. And then what you do is you deal with the pot of money you have. So you're paying yourself first and then you structure your life around the pot of money you have right now. Um, and guess what? You can do that, you know? Um, and so if you got to start small, start small, but it's really the habit. You got to get that habit going. And if you wait until you pay off all your debt, I just think that's a bad idea. Now, you know, take a percentage, pay off your debt, but I think doing them both at the same time um, really helps establish that habit. It's really, really interesting. Um, what, are the, what are some more of these, un, these kind of surprising habits of the super wealthy? Because, uh, you know, someone like Warren Buffett has always been a, a fascinating character to me um, for you know, the frugalness with which he lives. He doesn't live the kind of typical billionaire way that you would you would imagine he's kind of living in the same house that he's had for many many years he drives a very humble car are these are this is this more the kind of habits that the super wealthy actually embody it is actually and so um there's been studies on that um i don't know that i've seen any studies i couldn't tell you what the average billionaire does i mean i know a few um yep. some of them are extremely lavish spenders and, and do that um i i really couldn't tell you how many live the Warren Buffett lifestyle. Um, but you know, I, they definitely do. And, um, so in our study, just to sort of accentuate the point. So in our study, we, we looked at ultra wealthy versus middle class. Mm. Um, the ultra wealthy in this study had 18 times more money than the middle class. That's a lot of money. Um, we also asked them how much money they were spending on things and they only spent twice as much 
on house on things like houses, cars, vacations, and watches. So just to give you some some insight into the degree to which they weren't spending, like you, Wait, you would expect they would spend, you know, 18 it, times more. Yeah. Is, is that is that a relative thing or is it actually they only spend twice as much as the middle class? Yeah. So we asked, we asked, actually asked, we divided them into two groups um, based on their, their wealth status. And um, we asked them exactly how much money did you pay? for your last car, watch, vacation, or house. And what we saw is that they, they had on average 18 times more money, but they only spent twice as much. Wow. Yeah, I mean, wow is right. I was blown <laughs> away. Like, I didn't expect that. You know, that wasn't something I expected it to be that profound. Um, but what they understand is that, you know, what you really want to do is um, get a body of money working for you so that eventually it can pay you so you're not reliant on your um, your own sweat to, to, you know, pay your bills and, fund your life. Mm. Um, I read, uh, as I was saying earlier, I read the um, Thomas Stanley book, A Millionaire Next Door, uh, where he talks about the kind of the typical uh, American millionaire. And again, kind of pointing towards lots of these insights that it's not the behavior they were expecting. It's not the lavish spending. It's actually often very uh, blue collar workers who had set up their own businesses who had maintained a very frugal level of living, didn't get into that kind of trap of keeping up with the Joneses uh, and just kept on building their businesses and then started investing and investing very sensibly, investing in other sorts of companies that they understood, agricultural machinery, engineering, uh, production, those types of things, and kind of did that for many, many years. And then in their 50s, that's when their wealth starts to really, really grow. And then comparing that to, say, doctors who are quite famously have a high burn rate where they might be earning very high salaries but are not actually accumulating any wealth because there's a, there's a different sort of social game that's being played of keeping up with other people, keeping up with appearances, high expenditure, private schools, all these types of things. Um, and I, I just, yeah, it just, it's really, really interesting that wealth is not what we think it's really not, you know, and, and when I started out, so I, I did replicate some of that research. So it was a little bit more up to date. Right. And then I threw in the whole psychology aspect to try to figure out what mm. really differentiates them. And, and one of the money scripts that the ultra wealthy were more likely to endorse was what we call money vigilance. Um, so it's not money extravagance, it's money vigilance. So they're vigilant around their money. So there's a, a sense of anxiety that is sort of built in that which is like, I need to save for the future. And as a matter of fact, I'd be a nervous wreck if I didn't have money saved for the future. Now that, now that belief is not shared nearly as intensely by people who are in the lower socioeconomic status. It's just not as important. So that's the kind of belief that I would want to instill in somebody who is um, hoping to become wealthy or increase their wealth or their net worth over time is this sort of this real passionate commitment to saving and having enough. Um, what's also interesting is that compared to lower socioeconomic groups, the ultra wealthy in our study were more likely to tell people that they made less than they actually did, <laughs> not more. And, and what's interesting is another category in our study we called money status. Th these individuals had less money, but were more likely to only buy something if it was new, to tell people they made more than they actually did, and to really wrap their self-esteem around money, which led to overspending. So it's that vigilance is, is that other psychological characteristic um, which, which you need to balance a little bit. Like one of the problems is people can amass enormous amounts of wealth and be so anxious. They're basically living like Ebenezer Scrooge, which is actually the title of my first book <laughs> was looking at the psychology of Ebenezer Scrooge and his transformation. Um, but, you know, look, looking at like, you know, you, you got to have some balance around it, but without a doubt, people who are very committed to saving and, and sort of having some anxiety about not having enough are the ones who end up acquiring more. And it's interesting you mentioned uh, Ebenezer Scrooge. Your book was, was it The Financial Wisdom of Ebenezer Scrooge? That was the title of it. And his sort of transformation from being very tight-fisted to generous. Um, is that another kind of uh, characteristic of accumulating wealth is generosity that we might not associate, that we might not normally associate with the, wealth, with the wealthy? Yes. I mean, it is true. Like, um, I, I don't have the data in front of me, but it's true that, you know, people who have more tend to give more. 
um, at, at least in terms of dollar amounts. And like Warren Buffett, for example, he's planning on giving all of his money away, basically, um, mm. to uh, Bill Gates and Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, which is obviously a charitable organization doing fabulous things in the world. Um, and that's what wealth gives you the opportunity to do is have a broader impact. Um, and so it's something I think to, to aspire to. Brilliant. Dr. Brad, thank you very much. This has been absolutely fascinating conversation and very, very insightful. And uh, thank you very much. My pleasure, Ryan. It was, it was a lot of fun. And that's a wrap. Thank you so much for listening. And don't forget to book your 15-minute chat with me by using the link in the information. I look forward to speaking with you. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.